Twice in my lifetime, the long arm of destiny has reached across the oceans and involved the entire life and manhood of the United States. To the youth of America and to the youth of all the Britons, I say, we must go on. It must be world anarchy or world order. You will find in the British Commonwealth and Empire good comrades to whom you are united by other ties besides those of state policy and public need. Law, language, literature, common conceptions of what is right and decent, a marked regard for fair play, a stern sentiment of impartial justice, and above all, the love of personal freedom, these are common conceptions on both sides of the ocean among the English-speaking peoples. Sir Winston Churchill, man of the century, spoke those prophetic words to Americans gathered in the midst of World War II. Twelve years later, he retired from his second term as prime minister after a political career that brought a new word to the dictionary, Churchillian, a symbol of faith, humor, courage, optimism, and that great goal which remains a reference point for world leaders today, the unending quest for liberty and the brotherhood of man. This is Gregory Peck. I'm speaking to you as a founding member of the Churchill Center in Washington, D.C., an organization I greatly admire and support. My purpose is to tell you about the wonderful things it is doing and how you could help me and its other founding members ensure that this unique institution goes on forever. The Churchill Center's mission is educational, its scope international. Its goal is to promote study of the life and thought of Sir Winston Spencer Churchill, to foster research about his speeches, writings, and deeds, to advance knowledge of his example as a statesman, and by programs of teaching and publishing, to impart that learning to men, women, and young people around the world. Thirty years ago, the International Churchill Societies were founded to ensure that Sir Winston's contributions to the history, political philosophy, and literature of the great democracies were never forgotten. Today, the societies comprise four worldwide organizations with thousands of members, united by an affection for a great man, an appetite to honor his memory, to maintain his place in history, and to impart his ever-relevant wisdom to future generations. The Churchill Societies have helped bring about republication of over 20 of Churchill's out-of-print books. Their greatest achievement to date was to sponsor publication of the final document volumes of Churchill's official biography. Today we stand at the brink of a new century, whose history will be determined by our sons and daughters. Will they make the same mistakes of the past hundred years? Not if people like Churchill figure in their thoughts, their training, their comprehension of history. To accomplish just that, the Churchill Societies founded the Churchill Center. Its goal is to impart Churchill's unique quality of statecraft to the people who will guide their countries in future generations. In the teaching of history, political science, and international relations, Churchill is quite obviously too important to be overlooked. Professor Paul Ray, J.P. Walker Professor of History, University of Tulsa, appreciates Churchill's timely views on the situation of Western civilization today. The two great world wars are now long gone. The Cold War has come to an end. And so we no longer find ourselves hovering on the verge of conflict with a single foe. Our situation today more closely resembles the plight of the late Victorians than that of Pericles, Archidamus, Alcibiades, and Lysander. And while we still have much to learn from Thucydides, 
There's something to be said for asking contemporary students to read Winston Churchill's lively accounts of the dirty little wars that his countrymen had to fight at the end of the last century in defense of their empire and their way of life. In an age when Americans, Britons, and Canadians are likely to be called on to respond to ugly little conflicts marked by social, sectarian, and tribal rivalries in odd corners of the world, the Arabian Peninsula, the Caucasus, the Horn of Africa, the Balkans, Central Africa, the Maghreb, and the Caribbean, to mention just the most recent examples, and there will be many more to come in the next 20 years, I can think of no other historical work in such a time that more deserves our attention than Churchill's The River War. The Churchill Center is individually endowed and answerable only to its own governors, but it works closely with distinguished colleges and universities. Your support of the Churchill Center makes possible academic endowments supporting an unprecedented variety of courses, activities, and publications, seminars for teachers and outstanding students on aspects of Churchill's multifaceted career. There is still so much that has not been carefully studied. We need well-educated people to focus on new, unplumbed topics, publishing seminar papers, lectures, and books. Two books have already resulted from the Churchill Center Symposia, college and graduate level courses on Churchill's career, with emphasis on areas of current interest such as Eastern Europe, Ireland, Russia, and the Middle East. An annual Churchill lecture by a prominent world figure attended by students sponsored by the center. Video programs for libraries and universities. Fellowships and grants for graduate students writing dissertations on Churchill. Nothing will do more to preserve Churchill's legacy than helping young academics produce new research, which they will use in their subsequent academic careers. Visiting professors at leading universities funded by the Churchill Center will conduct courses that focus on Churchill's experience. Prominent among these is Sir Martin Gilbert, Churchill's official biographer. Winston Churchill first came here in 1922, and he was to live here at Chartwell for more than 40 years. This house was the center of his family life, of the tremendous fun and vivacity of everything that surrounded the Churchill family. It was also the center of much of his political activity. Here came people with secret information about the truth about Nazi Germany. Here he crafted many of his finest speeches. Here he wrote many of his finest books. It was really the hub of Winston Churchill's life. This is Chartwell. We came to Chartwell, Churchill's country home, to talk with Sir Martin Gilbert. It is the place where one can be nearest to the spirit and reality of the great man. I'm often asked why one should study Churchill today. After all, he died in 1965 and he was born almost in the middle of the 19th century. I think one answer is that he was a very modern man. His ideas were not fixed to the events of the day, not fixed to the First World War or the Second World War, but to some vision that he had of what not only Britain could be, and of course he was an intense patriot, but also what the world could be. He was not a believer that things drifted. He believed that man and individual men, and he himself, could move things in a particular direction. He had a faith that human beings, if only they would work together and work in the interest of mankind in general, could get things better. And he himself, although often out of office, often in what are called his wilderness years, often very much isolated politically, very much denounced and belittled and abused, he believed that he himself did have something in him, not only in his physical and mental abilities, but also in his ideals, in his mind, something that mattered and something that could make a difference to what his contemporaries 
and indeed we, and indeed the next generations, the 21st century, could benefit from. He believed, for example, during the long dark night of communism, which lasted from 1917 until 1991. He never saw its end, but he had a great belief that the spirit of man, even when captured by communist tyranny, or indeed by any totalitarian system, that the spirit of man would find some way of breaking free from tyranny. Is it